You are listening to the podcast of the Economic Society at George Mason University. The Economic Society is a registered student organization that is committed to guiding students, organizing events, and provoking discussion. I'm Carlos Borger, president of the Economic Society and the host of this conversation. We're going to get this started. Uh, thank you all for being here. And to introduce our great esteemed guests, uh, Professor Donald Boudreau is a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program of Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics uh, at the Mercatus Center here at George Mason University. He is a Mercatus Center board member and a professor of economics and former uh, chair of the Department of Economics here at GMU. Uh, professor Boudreau writes often in news outlets such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, he appears on the radio, he's appeared on TV, uh, he's everywhere, but this evening he is with us. I'm here. So Professor Boudreau, thank you so much. Thank you, Carl, for having me. Thank you all for having me. There's nothing I am prouder to be in life other than the father of my son, than a George Mason University economist. So, so I just want to start with asking you, where are you from and how did you make your way into economics? I was born and raised in New Orleans. My father dropped out of school in sixth grade. I'm the oldest of four. No one in my family had ever gone to college. And I was in a generation, I was born in 1958. I was in a generation where, it, my generation was the first where, it was sort of, it was the first generation where it was expected, kind of, that you'd go to college. But no one in my family had gone to college. And I was a terrible high school student. And so I'm the oldest of four. And my mother wanted me to go to college. I didn't want to go to college. And so I went to a, I had terrible grades in high school. I went to a little state school in South Louisiana called Nichols State University. And I was going to go for a year. And I was going to get a job at the shipyard where my dad worked and where I worked in the summer. Fortunately, by the, the, some wonderful fates, I got put in an economics class. I, just, I didn't know what economics was. I just got stuck in this economics class. And I had the misfortune of coming of age in the 1970s, which the only thing good about that decade is the music. And so I remember the first time I drove a car by myself, I was 15 years old, my dad gave me the keys to the car. This is November of 1973, and I had to go wait in line to buy gasoline. Everyone in my class, when I was in that course as an 18-year-old a few years later in college, remembered waiting in line to buy gasoline. And I had a great professor. She, she, she died a few years ago, but she and I remain close. Michelle Francois, who was just a great teacher. And she, she drew a supply and demand curve on the board one day. And she said, you remember, you remember waiting in line to buy gasoline? Yeah. Here's why. And she said, the government has a price ceiling on energy. And when you have a price ceiling, quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied. That's a shortage. When shortages arise, you wait in line to buy it. I thought that was the most, to this day, I think it may be the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. It was January 17th, 1977. The scales fell from my eyes. It's like I was born again. I, 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 within, within a few uh, uh, weeks, I, I decided I was going to stay in college rather than drop out. And by the, within a year, I decided I want a PhD in the subject because of the power of supply and demand. And um, so it's, it's, it's the power of good teaching. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I was fortunate then, I was, I'll add this, and we do this at GMU. When I took economics, uh, it was very common to have principles of macro taught before principles of micro. Had I had principles of macro before principles of micro, you wouldn't know me. I would be an unemployed shipyard worker. Uh, but fortunately, I got stuck in this micro course first, and that's what really turned me on to economics. And so we at George Mason, we did this, we started this in the 1980s during my first stint here in the faculty. We, we switched so that mic uh, 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 micro comes before macro. It's the more fundamental and the more important of the two courses. Mm -hmm. so. You also have uh, a law degree from the University of Virginia. I do. Interesting. Yeah. So your, your most cited paper was 
was written in 1993, and it was titled Rewriting the Constitution, an Economic Analysis of the Constitutional Amendment Process. Uh, just reading from part of the extract, authors contrast the Bill of Rights amendments, which established pre-commitments and reduced the agency costs of government, with the latter 17 amendments, which expanded the federal government and increased agency cost. Uh, so drawing upon your legal and your economic background, what amendments do you think we should make next? Well, I was, I was not expecting that question. What <laughs> amendments? That, that's a heavy load. I got to think carefully about that. Uh, I don't know how to word, I wouldn't know how to word the amendment. Um, that would be for people more skilled in legislative drafting than I am. And there's an actual, there are actual courses in legislative drafting where you actually learn these things. But I would like to see an amendment, if I could have one, an amendment to the Constitution that would, uh, as, as much as possible, prohibit uh, a special interest group legislation. An amendment that would require that all legislation apply equally to everyone. So everyone pays the same percentage rate of taxes, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no one gets special privileges to be protected from competition. This is at the national level, of course. Um, I don't know how to word that, but that, and, I, and I don't know if such wording is actually possible to make it effective, but that's what I would like, I'd like to see. Um, I, I'll cheat and I'll offer a second amendment. I actually, I actually do favor a balanced budget amendment. Um, there are dangers in a balanced budget amendment because there are ways that government can get around it. Uh, but I, I think the, my, my, my guess is that a well-worded balanced budget amendment would be worthwhile because the, the ease with which the national government today borrows money uh, and, and, and the ease which, with which that, those borrowed monies now are monetized, basically causing the Fed to pay those debts off by creating money, and hence inflation, is much greater than even 10 years ago I thought, or 15 years ago I thought that would be. Things changed with the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. So some kind of amendment to, to, to dramatically reduce uh, special interest group privileges and a balanced budget amendment. Mm -hmm. so so you, you, you have spoken against increasing the deficit today because it's not free money. Future taxpayers The government budget it. deficit. Yeah. The government budget deficit, yes. Yeah. Uh, borrowing against the future seems to be good personal policy, though. When you, when you look yeah. at yeah. lifetime consumption, you want to smooth it out rather than having the majority of your consumption occur at the end of your life. You can which, is what, which is what most of you were doing, which is what I did when I was a student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's, per, that's good personal that, that is not bad personal policy. Mm -hmm. If you know, if you're, you're 19 years old and you're getting a degree, you, you can be pretty sure that that investment in your human capital is going to increase your earning ability. Uh, if you don't have the spending power now, and most, a lot of people don't, or your family has a spending power, to pay for that, uh, th that acquisition today, college tuition, of acquiring that human capital, it's perfectly rational uh, in, indeed, in, uh, 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 good to acquire that spending power by borrowing it because you know the chances are very high that you can repay it in the future. The government, however, is not an individual. Mm -hmm. And a lot of mistakes, many mistakes, are made when people anthropomorphize the government or anthropomorphize society. Well, it's good for Joe as a young man to to, to borrow money. It's good for Susie as a young woman to borrow money to pay for their college education. It is. That does not, it does not follow from that fact that therefore it's good for the government to be able to borrow money in order to smooth out its, its um, uh, uh, consumption and spending patterns over the future. We can talk about reasons why. I'm happy to do that because I like that topic. Uh, but I would just warn you all against anthropomorphism anthropomorphization of society. I don't, there probably is no error that is uh, the source of as much confusion and bad policy as is the anthropomorphization of society. Mm -hmm. 
You've also spoken uh, in the past about the difference between calling someone a lawmaker versus, versus a legislator. I get that from Hayek. Yeah. From Hayek. Yeah. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So, so when, I, when I was your age, so I, I'll go back to my college experience a little bit. I was, I was incredibly lucky. Again, I went to this place no one ever heard of, Nickel State University. And it had two really, oh, all the professors were pretty good, but it had two really good professors. This woman who was my first economics teacher, um, I, I love her memory until the day I die. Uh, and it had another, uh, I would pester, I loved economics so much, I would pester her. At one point she said, oh, you, you gotta, gotta go see Dr. Field, Dr. Bill Field, who became my real mentor as an undergraduate. This is the mid-70s, and he was very much into Hayek. And uh, uh, he, uh, I remember he gave me a book before I'd heard of Hayek. He gave me a book by Milton Friedman. And he said, read this book. He said, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And I remember reading the book. It was a collection of Milton Friedman's Newsweek essays. And I remember bringing the book back to him, saying, I don't know who this Milton Friedman guy is, but he must be the greatest living economist. And uh, uh, Dr. Field, as I then called him, said, no. He's the second greatest. And I remember literally getting tingly. Like, Whoa, there's someone better? Who is that? And he said, Hayek. I never heard of Hayek before. And he reached back and he gave me a book by Hayek. That was my introduction to Hayek. So I, I, I immersed myself in Hayek's work uh, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as an undergraduate. And um, when I was an undergraduate, so, so the, one of the first books, the first book I read by Hayek was The Road to Serfdom. The next book I read by Hayek was volume one of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, which was his trilogy that came out in the 1970s. I, I recommend strongly volume one, volume two. The only book by Hayek that I don't recommend is volume three. Don't read it. Um, not because it's bad, it's just, it, it's very un-Hayekian. It's a whole other story. In volume one of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, so in the title, Law, Legislation, he distinguishes between the two. And he makes the case that, he says, law is that which are those rules that we abide by and that we are willing to enforce that emerge spontaneously through the course of humans interacting with each other. Legislation, in contrast, are rules designed by, uh, the, well, by the government that are enforced. Now, the legislation can be, can be good and worthwhile, but it's a fundamentally different kind of rule. So a, a law would be, uh, uh, if, 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 there, there's a, if, if uh, you go to the gasoline station and all the pumps are filled, you, you, you park your car behind. You don't jump ahead in line. We just follow that law. Uh, it's not designed by anyone. It's just something we expect other people to do, and we do it ourselves. Legislation is rules designed by, by the state. And, and those two, are their source is very different, and their um, consequences are very different. And, and so I, uh, probably to the point of uh, ex excess, complain about people who use law and legislation synonymously. And most people do. Adam Smith used law and legislation synonymously. And I love Adam Smith so much, I once had a Scottish Terrier and I named him Adam Smith. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I, I, I hate it when people call legislators lawmakers. They're not lawmakers, they're legislation makers. Legislation is very different. It could be good, it could be bad, but it's not the same thing as law. Interesting. So, I, I, I think that you do consider yourself to be a classical liberal in the style of Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's fair. Uh, so the Center for New Liberalism, I don't know if you're aware of that project, uh, they just released an overview of everything that they, that they believe in and their section on economic policy caught my eye. Um, so they say, and I'm just going to quote exactly here, markets are extremely good at creating wealth. They are less good at redistributing it. Uh, we, they, support a market-based economy that promotes economic growth and nurtures innovation, while also supporting a safety net that shares the gains of that growth with everyone. How does that statement track with your own views on a safety net for society? Uh, I, I, I would not sign my name 
to that statement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a pretty hardcore libertarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, I call myself a classical liberal, but I'm pretty hardcore. Um, and unlike most people, the older I get, the more radical I get. <laughs> um, so I think we have to distinguish, so this is a rich question. We have to distinguish between uh, what's acceptable and, 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 and what's ideal. Uh, if, if, if the price of obtaining a, lib a, a, a much greater move toward liberalism is for the government to create this kind of safety net, I'm willing to pay that price. I don't like the policy. I, I think it makes society less free and less prosperous and less fair than it would otherwise be. But I think it's potentially an acceptable price to pay. In my ideal world, and by the way, this is this was Hayek's view. In my ideal world, there is no government created and maintained safety net. In, in the real world, with a free market, uh, there is no distribution of income. And if there's no distribution, there's nothing to be redistributed. People produce income, and there's no distributor who then passes it out. The, the rewards people get uh, are determined by how much they produce or how, how uh, much they're able to persuade their families or their loved ones, their friends, uh, philanthropist to, to, to donate to them. Um, I think that, let's call it a distribution of income because we have no better word for it now, but that distribution of income would be the ideal one. In a market economy, uh, the, 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 there's nothing, un I don't see anything unfair about the the arrange the 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 out the, the outcomes of incomes that are generated by market uh, 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 commercial exchanges. Yeah, some people wind up to be really rich. Elon Musk is much richer than I will ever be. Much richer probably than you will ever be. If you think I'm wrong on that, give me your telephone number because I'd like to have lunch with you because <laughs> I, I raise money for the department. Um, uh, but. But let, 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 here's a more fundamental way that I think about this. Let's focus on what really matters. And that's not the amount of digits uh, that exist in your bank account. Uh, what matters is access to consumable goods. So I do this mental experiment. I, you heard me do it, I think, in the class that you're in. I do this mental experiment. I've done it for a long time, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to do it. Imagine that we, you, you take one of your ancestors, no matter where you're from, from the, some pre-industrial time, some 1500 AD, 1500 BC, that person is almost surely a really, really decrepitly poor person by our standards. All of, virtually all of our ancestors were decrepitly poor by our standards. We can't imagine how desperately poor they were. So let, imagine resurrecting that person in one of Jeff Bezos's home or Elon Musk's home or Bill Gates' home, pick, pick, pick the multi-gazillionaire, and ask, what would most impress that person? My guess is the first thing that would most impress that person, other than the fact that they've come back from the dead, which would be impressive, is the, 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 that thing up there, that glowing lamp. Right? Wow, what is that? They've never seen that before. They've never seen artificial light. They would be impressed by the fact there's a hard roof over their head and hard floors beneath their feet that they're in a room that maintains the same temperature year-round, even though the temperature outside varies greatly. They'd be impressed by the fact that no one has ever been hungry, truly hungry, where they're on the verge of starvation. They'd be impressed with the fact that we're as tall and straight as we are, and our skin is clean, that we can bathe every day, and that we have multiple changes of clothing, that we can pull out these things, and talk in real time to people who are well out of earshot, indeed some people who are across the ocean. In other words, I think the thing that would impress most people, if they were resurrected from pre-industrial times, with the, the life of a, of a, of a, a multi-gazillionaire today, would be things that we all have access to, just by virtue of being alive and, and, and in, in, a, in a modern industrial 
economy, the things that we have, that all of us have. After this person would exist in this economy for, for many years, then that person would start to distinguish between the fact that when we want to fly across the ocean, we have to share an aluminum tube with a few hundred other people. Jeff Bezos has his own aluminum tube to fly across the ocean. But at first, that distinction, I think, would be of, of, of no measure. I think, uh, so you mentioned the, the article of mine that has most citations. The blog post of mine, act, by, actually, by far, the thing I've, wrote, I've written that's gotten by far the most readership is a blog post I wrote in February of 2016 um, on uh, John D. Rockefeller. And I said, uh, uh, so, so I wrote it in 2016, John D. Rockefeller was the richest American in 2016, probably the richest person in the world, in, excuse me, in 1916. He was dead in 2016, <laughs> wasn't very rich. And I said, you know, how much would you pay? You can do this experiment now in 2022. Said, how much would you pay in order to be the richest person in the world in 1916? Suppose, suppose we were in your power to, to go back to 1916 and be the richest person in the world. How much would you give up now? Would you want to do that? I think you probably wouldn't. Yeah, yeah see, Rockefeller could buy a really nice house uh, at, at Newport Beach in Rhode Island overlooking uh, the ocean. We can't do that. Rockefeller had his own private train car. We probably don't, couldn't buy our own private railroad car. Rockefeller had several homes all over the, the country. What did Rockefeller not have? He didn't have air conditioning. Uh, he had a telephone, but it was attached to a wall. Um, in 1916, he couldn't listen to broadcast radio. The first broadcast radio didn't happen until November of, of 1920. Um, he didn't have antibiotics, which is a real pain in the butt. Uh, so if, if he or one of his children or grandchildren uh, cut himself, there was a high chance that that cut would kill them. Today, we go to CVS and buy sand. We, we don't die from it. Um, I, I, I would not, I, I, it'll, I think in a very real way, and I'm, I, I, I'm not saying this to be provocative, I think it's true. I think all of us today are richer than John D. Rockefeller was in 1916, just looking at material wealth. I have no idea about happiness, right? but just looking at material wealth, every one of us is, I believe, arguably richer than was the richest human being just a mere 100 years ago. The richest human being in the lifetime of some people still alive today. That's what the market brings. And so the focus, so I disagree that the market, the distribution of wealth is a problem. I, I, think, it's an, I think it's an insignificant rounding error compared to the benefits that the market brings. So Peter Thiel has his famous saying of, we were promised flying cars and said that we got 144 characters in reference to the sci-fi dreams of the 1960s and what life is like day to day these days. Uh, Tyler Cowen, who teaches here at George Mason, has studied what he calls the great stagnation between 1970 and 1920. Uh, you seem much more optimistic on how the past 50 years have been. Yep. Do you, do you think popular culture is too negative? Yep. Yep. So let, let me, as I've done now for the past two years, let me put a big caveat. Uh, the, the past two years have made me more pessimistic than I've ever been. The reaction to COVID uh, uh, scared me and continues to scare me. I, I, I am, my, my optimism about the future has been muted a bit because I don't know what the it's too early to tell exactly what the precedents from the COVID reaction will be, how long lasting they will be, how deep and how horrible they'll be. Putting that aside, so let's say we're having this discussion in January of 2020 rather than in September of 2022. Uh, yeah, I'm super optimistic. And I think, I think the, the previous 20 years, uh, excuse me, 50 years, going back to 1970, have been far more um, uh, uh, marked by far greater growth than Peter Thiel and Tyler Cowen and Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Uh, I've had this discussion with Tyler. I think he's just wrong on this. Um, uh, 
So what, what, what Tyler will say, and, and, and I say this not false modesty, Tyler's forgotten more than I'll ever know. He's much smarter than me. Um, but on this, I think he's mistaken. His argument is, uh, or a part of his argument is this. Um, this is what he does in Averages Over and, and uh, I can't remember the name of his other book on the same, on the same topic. Um, yeah, the, the Great Stagnation, the great one you mentioned. Yeah. Um, he'll say, well, you know, what? Look, look, look what happened in the first part of the 20th century. We got radio, we got automobiles, we got airplanes, and look, we, we, we're, now we're not getting those things. And I think, well, okay, well, as we become richer, we want to satisfy our highest demands first. We, we want to cure hunger. And, and there's very little in, human, in, in economic development that really can compare to wiping out hunger. Right? So some say, well, you know, 19th century, early 20th century, we wiped out hunger. What can compare to that? Well, in a way, nothing. Right? We wiped out hunger. Right? And then we wiped out a lot of diseases uh, that were, were, were commonplace. And yeah, so it's a good thing we wiped those out. And so as we progress, the, the emotional value of the, uh, of the challenges that we overcome, I think almost by necessity, won't be as impressive as the emotional value of the, of the things that we first oh, that, that overcame uh, 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 when, when industrialization began. Uh, so, yeah, going, f but, but, but the, Peter, the Peter Thiel quote, I mean, I think that's a little bit, that's a little bit uh, un unfair. But I, I, don't, I don't ever remember, first of all, being promised flying cars. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and, 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 and I was alive in this era when we were supposedly <laughs> promised flying cars. We were promised, this is a joke before, you, you're probably just a little bit too young to remember. Um, as recently as 1998, 1999, people would say, <laughs> you know, boy, back in the 50s and 60s, we kept hearing about, you know, video telephone calls, but it's, they're just never coming. The video phone never come. I did FaceTime with my son just about an hour before coming here. Right? We, we, we have it now. I was never, we never promised flying cars. Um, uh, the, uh, it's the things that we weren't promised because no one could predict them when Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter were in the White House, even Ronald Reagan was in the White House, that we, that we now have. Who could, no one could have predicted this, uh, this thing. I remember when I first saw one of these things in, 19, in, in 2007. It blew me away. Whoa, whoa, it, it's even got a calculator on it. Uh, that was a big deal. No one foresaw that when I was your age. No one foresaw personal computers when I was your age. I remember sitting, I was a, it was uh, uh, spring of 1980, my final semester as an undergraduate. I knew I was going off to graduate school that fall. And I remember being in a classroom and hearing a professor, his name was Wayne Shell, and he was a computer professor, and he had a loud voice. And I remember him talking, so this is 1980, this is just as IBM is starting to make noise about developing a personal computer. Uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak making noise with, with, with Macintosh. I remember hearing this, this guy, Wayne Shell, who's a very future optimistic guy, say, yeah, I predict that in about 10 years, you know, I, I, I bet you know, like one in 10 American families will have computers in their homes. And I remember thinking, that's ridiculous. <laughs> That's just absurd. You know, I'm optimistic about the future, but not that optimistic. I mean, computers are now almost disposable, right? Ah, I have this computer for two years. I think I'll throw it away and buy a new one, right? I, I got this computer here. So the, it's, it's the things that weren't promised, because no one could predict them, that we have. Um, it, it, you know, so look, the, 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 the world's not perfect. It'll never be perfect. And no matter what we have, we will always discover wants and desires and problems that we didn't know afflicted us until these new wants, desires, and problems arose. Um, and there will always be people who focus on those, and who blame the current system for not satisfying those problems, uh, curing those problems, satisfying those desires as well. But um, 
if, if, if you, and I, I, I did this in a series of blog posts on my, 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 my blog, Cafe Hayek, it's the greatest blog. <laughs> go check it out. Go, go, yeah, yeah. go check it out. Um, so I, I graduated from high school in 1976. And I kept hearing, I keep hearing, this relates to your question, you'll pardon me for going on. I kept hearing, starting in the late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, I kept hearing about the great stagnation. The great stagnation being that, well, middle class Americans, their standard of living peaked in the mid 70s. And ever since, it's stagnated. And, and people still say this, it's just stagnated. All the economic growth that's occurred in the United States has been captured by the top 1%. Well, I certainly, I grew up in a working class household, it wasn't top 1%. Uh, I'm not top 1% now, I'm a college professor. I mean, I, I make a nice living, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not a hedge fund manager. Um, and and, and this, this doesn't ring true to me. Now, personal experience is not a, a, a firm basis for making a scientific judgment, but I, uh, the, fir the first thing I ever bought on eBay, was like 2006, actually one of the few things I ever bought on eBay, uh, I bought a 1975 Sears catalog. Do you have any idea what that is? <laughs> yeah, I bought a 1975 Sears catalog. I bought it for 99 cents. No one was el else was bidding on it, so I was able to buy it at the minimum price for 99 cents. I intentionally paid to have it shipped to me overnight. I paid $21 to have it shipped to me overnight. I didn't need it overnight. Right? But I wanted to be able to say, honestly, I had to ship to you overnight. I wanted to be able to say that because in 1975, uh, uh, it, said, it, was, it was a fall, winter 75 catalog. No one whose name was not Gerald Ford or Howard Hughes or whoever was the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was having anything shipped to or from him or her overnight. It was just not available. You couldn't do it. And so in, the, in, in, in 2006, I had something shipped to me overnight for 20 bucks. Not, not bad. Anyway, so I had this catalog. I still have it. And uh, you go through the catalog and you can look at what goods are available at 1975 prices. And you can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you can find data on what the, the, the BLS calls uh, the, a, a, a full-time production and non-supervisory worker. Basically an ordinary worker, not, not hedge fund manager, not executives, not a... Not, uh, not, not a physician. People who work in factories and clerks and secretaries. This is what they make. You look at their, the wage that they were earning in 1975. I know what it was. I remember it's 20, it's, I remember because I, I read it. $4.71 an hour. That's what the typical worker made per hour in 1975. So you can see these prices in the Sears catalog. The, the coffee maker, the pair of jeans, the, the washer and dryer, the the propane grill, the, the stereo system. Sears sold lots of things. And so you can look at those prices and you can divide those prices by $4.71. And you can figure out how many hours did the typical worker have to work in 1975 to buy any of these things that Sears, the great retailer to middle America, sold in 1975. And then you can compare that to the number of hours a typical worker today has to work in order to earn enough income to buy comparable goods. And you know what you find? In almost all cases, the, the amount of time that, 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 that the typical American worker has to work today to earn enough income to buy a coffee maker, a pair of jeans, underwear, washer and dryer, uh, luggage, exercise bike, on and on and on and on. It's, it's much lower. Much not just modestly lower. It's like a fraction of the time. I, I, I remember the coffee maker. One, that's the first one I have in this presentation that I do. In 1975, a typical American worker had to work almost a whole day to earn enough income to buy a 10-cup drip coffee maker. Today, the typical American worker has to work about 45 minutes to earn enough income to buy a coffee maker. So you, you, you got most of your work day that you can earn income to buy other stuff. And so this notion that the middle class is stagnating is simply, it, it, it's not borne out in the data. It, it, uh, but, but people keep repeating that claim as if it is an established fact. And there are lots of, 
there are lots of claims that if they are repeated widely enough and frequently enough, get treated by the mainstream media and by most people, including professors, as being indisputably true. And this is a claim that is simply not true, I believe. It's not supportable by the facts. Mm -hmm. So economics is a field, wide, away of pro wide array of professors, wide, wide array of institutions. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement. You yourself have several high-profile disagreements with Paul Krugman being among them. Uh, for a group of people who are studying the same phenomena and more or less respecting the same truths, why do we see such divergence in, in views? So, um, I could discourse all night on that, and, 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 I, and don't worry, I won't. Uh, one reason is, this is a Hayekian reason, uh, the social sciences, which is what economics is, deal with complex phenomena, unlike the physical sciences, which deal with relatively simple phenomena. What that means is, at, at any moment, one of the things, at any moment in, in, for social phenomena, any social phenomena we observe, the price of that television, the price of that pizza, uh, the population of Denmark, there are countless, countless decisions that go in to generating those results. No one of which, these decisions simply are too numerous and too complex for anyone to observe. Uh, and, and because there are so many different inputs going into resulting in any particular output of, 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 of a consequence, uh, it's very easy to say, oh, well, that happened in spite of this other thing, or that happened because of this other thing. And it, it, of course it's always possible. It, so many things are happening. Uh, uh, did the price of the pizza rise because of President Biden's policies, or despite President Biden's policies, or maybe it's unconnected with President Biden's policies. You can't say, you, we, we can't look out in the real world and, 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 and observe that in the way that we can observe the trajectory of the moon relative to that of Venus. You just can't do it. So that's one reason. Another reason is economics, uh, be, because it has such obvious relevance for public policy making, people with different political proclivities, uh, want to claim the authority of economics to support their policies. Um, and, and so there's, there, there is a, and it's true for all of us. I mean, this is not, you know, not, it's not that they are guilty of it, but we're pure and not guilty of it. I'm sure I'm guilty of it. Uh, but if you look at, if you take, take, you mentioned Paul Krugman. You look at Paul Krugman, whose specialty is international economics. That's what he won the Nobel Prize for. If you look at what Paul Krugman wrote on international economics before he became a columnist for the New York Times, there is no disagreement between Paul Krugman and me, or Paul Krugman and almost any other economist. You read Paul Krugman's Pop Internationalism. It's a great book. It's smack down the line. No disagreement at all. Could have been written by Milton Friedman. Could have been written by Don Boudreau. I, didn't, I don't have his skill with language, but it, 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 it's all stuff that, that I, any randomly chosen economist, disagree with. Where Paul Krugman does become disagreeable is when he starts becoming a columnist. And then where he, start, and, and where he, and then he in many of his columns, he says, he'll backtrack from what he said. Well, I said this uh, I was a, uh, uh, in, in 1999, but I, I now realize he's playing to a different audience. Um, maybe he's sincere. I don't know. I never met the man. But if you look at what he wrote about trade when he was a practicing economist, it, I find very little to disagree with. So. Mm -hmm. so going back a little bit, you mentioned your own blog, Cafe Hayek. Uh, Tyler Cowen has marginal revolutions. Uh, Mason, as a whole, our economics department, is known for its blogging culture. And that culture emerged under your chairmanship of the economics department. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to incentivize that? among your faculty? But it wasn't a conscious choice. I mean, there was, mm -hmm. no, there was no decision that we got together one day and said, let's, let's you know, incentivize mm -hmm. uh, blogging. So George Mason's economics department has been unique for a long time, going back long before I was department chairman. It started, um, you should know a little bit about the history of this department. Um, it, the, the uniqueness of George Mason started really, I think, in 1977, when Jim Bennett 
joined the faculty. Jim Bennett just retired this year. Some of you may know of Professor Bennett. Jim Bennett uh, did a lot of public policy writing, but high quality, high quality empirical stuff. He founded the Journal of Labor Research. And uh, this was a, 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 a no, no, one out, no one further west than Manassas had heard of George Mason at that time, right? F further north, you know, further east than the Anacostia had ever heard of this place. Uh, but Jim Bennett, for a variety of reasons, winds up here. Karen Vaughan, uh, uh, who got her PhD in economics at Duke, her husband's a lawyer. She, they wanted to live in D.C. She was uh, a, a, an Austrian economist. She comes here. Walter Williams gets denied. This is the big event. Walter Williams gets denied tenure at Temple because Walter is very out, you know, Walter Williams is a black economist, very outspoken about the policies that were then thought to promote black economic advance. And Walter was saying, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. Here's the way to do it. You got it all wrong. Temple denies him tenure. Um, Walter has a lot of opportunity to do public speaking and testifying in Washington, although he never wanted to be a government employee. Jim Bennett and Karen Vaughan worked out an arrangement for Walter to join the faculty at George Mason. So Walter becomes famous because he's on Milton Friedman's Free to Choose program. He's got a syndicated column. Uh, Walter Williams is here. Uh, uh, Richie Fink, who was on the economics faculty at Rutgers and started the Center for the Study of Market Processes. This is now called the Mercatus Center, Center for the Study of Market Processes. Richie Fink, uh, uh, now called Rich Fink. He's, he's retired, but back then we called him Richie. Uh, Rich got denied tenure at Rutgers. Uh, Rich has uh, some students with him at Rutgers, undergraduate students, one of whom is named Dan Klein, the other of whom is named Tyler Cowan. And so Rich looks at George Mason, well, Walter Williams is there, Karen Vaughn is there, Jim Bennett's there. They're building kind of a nice market-oriented department. What about there? Rich Fink moves in 1982. 80, I think, 82, 80 or 80, 81. He moves the Center for the Study of Market Processes from Rutgers to George Mason. He brings Tyler and Dan Klein with him as undergraduate students. Tyler and Dan Klein are undergraduates from George Mason. Uh, Dan went on to get his PhD from NYU. Tyler went on to get his PhD from Harvard. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's becoming like a black hole for free market-oriented thinking. Uh, so, uh, 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 Walter's here, the Center for Study of Market Process here, and these people care not just about high quality research, they care about talking to the general public. We, we, we looked at what Milton Friedman, we, I wasn't part of them then, but they looked at what Milton Friedman was doing. and said, that's important. You know, he's writing, he, he's not just talking to fellow economists, but he has a column in Newsweek, he has his now famous television show, called Free to Choose. We want to do that. We, we, we value that. We think that's important. In 1982, the Center for Study of Public Choice at, in Blacksburg uh, m made a decision to, to move here, and that's what really cemented things when Buchanan and Tulloch moved here in, 80, in, in 83. In 83. Um, and, uh, and, and so since then, GMU has been the place to come to. And so all of these people, so from, from Jim Bennett, Karen Vaughn, Walter Williams, Rich Fink, uh, Jim Buchanan himself, although he did very little writing for the general public, did some, he valued it. He understood the importance of, of that he, economics is not just a, a discipline uh, for the sake of economists so that we can talk to each other and help each other solve clever puzzles. It's about making the world a better place, and to make the world a better place, ultimately, you want to, to speak to the general public about what we know. Um, so by the time, so I, I was on the faculty here in the mid-80s. I, I left to go to law school uh, after various other places. When Walter stepped down as chairman in, 19, in 2001, they brought me back as chairman. And, and by, by this time, it's recognized that one of the things we do is, is speak to the general public. We write op-eds, we appear on television, and unlike a lot of departments, we actually reward you for that. You, you can't get tenure just for that. You've got to publish academic research, and you've got to be a good teacher. Uh, but, 
but we also give, we, we also do reward people doing that. So uh, not long after I became chairman, this is, this is when the possibility of doing things like blogs began. And so it was just natural for us to reward um, Tyler and Alex for, for successfully entering this, this new space, this, this blogging space. Um, and then Russ Roberts and I entered it a, co a couple years after Alex and Tyler did. So it was, just, it was just part of what we did. And it's part of what I am proud to say we continue to do. Uh, we, 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 we like it when our colleagues publish in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So I can do just one more question, then we'll open it up to Q&A for everyone. Um, just to wrap it up, what do you think is the, val the current day value of a Mason Econ degree? What's good about being here? So, so, so let me just make a pitch for econ degrees in general. As Brian Ka <laughs> my colleague Brian Kaplan says, you may have heard him say this, but it's, it's, true. it's true. The way Brian puts it, and if you know Brian, Brian has a very unique way of putting things, but he's, he's almost always right. The guy is astonishingly well-informed and intelligent. He's one of my favorite colleagues. Brian says that, it, it, so econ majors, no matter where you are, no matter what, no, GMU, FSU, Harvard, doesn't matter. It is the major, the undergraduate major, that promises the highest uh, lifetime income. It, 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 it is the, uh, I can't remember exactly how it puts it, is the highest lifetime income compared to effort to get the major. It's a serious major, right? But it's not electrical engineering. It's the right? highest earning of the easy majors. It's the highest earning of the easy majors, yeah. As, as maybe that is the way he puts it, yeah. And so th that's something to say for it, right? I mean, it's, you know, okay, so highest earning. What do you, I mean, economics major. Oh, well, let me pay you a lot of money, right? <laughs> um, uh, as, as for a, and, and, so, and that's true for a George Mason econ degree, no less than it is for any, uh, an econ degree from any other school. But a lot of George Mason, a disproportionately large number of GMU econ majors, compared to econ majors at other institutions, uh, uh, have the bug. They want to get a graduate degree, either a master's degree or a PhD, or they want to go to law school and apply their economics to, uh, uh, they want to do public policy work. They want to they join the, the effort to press the case for classical liberalism and, and, and greater economic literacy. I should say that what, what I think of myself as doing as a GMU econ faculty member, my job is not to uh, impose my ideology, oppress my ideology on anyone. Uh, my job is to promote economic literacy. That's part of my job. I think that's a legitimate part of my job. Uh, and, and I believe that doing that successfully uh, helps to, cre it's, it's, it's me doing my small part to making, to, to increasing the chances that the world will become a better place in the way that I think, I define better place. But, I, but, but, but in the classroom, I don't promote an ideology. When I do economic, formal economic research, it's not to promote, promote an ideology, it's to create better economic information. Uh, and, and, and as opposed to just talking to my fellow economists about clever puzzles, which is what too many economists in many other departments do. Um, so anyway, GMU econ majors, a lot of them, I, I, I know some of you, I don't know all of you, obviously. Uh, some of you will go to graduate school. Some of you go to law school. Uh, uh, but, but most of you will just get a bachelor's degree, and that's fine, but you will, uh, for the rest of your lives, uh, I'm convinced. Uh, it's kind of like a vaccine, actually. Mm. Right? It's kind of like a lifetime inoculation, <laughs> right? You're, con you're inoculated against, against being victimized by some of the common fallacies that people who are not well-learned in economics fall victim to. Even if what you wind up doing has nothing to do with economics, um, you, you, you will have learned things by being a GMU econ major that I, I think will 
be with you for the rest, I certainly hope will be with you for the rest of your lives. Until we become major media columnists and pundits. <laughs> well, presumably you would, you would do so honestly. That's yeah. the dream. That's the dream. Yeah. Russell Boudreaux, thank you very much. My Appreciate pleasure. It. These questions come directly from attendees of the event. Markets are prone to boom and bust cycles, and malinvestment is considered a possible prognosis for these cycles. Is legislation cyclical and plagued by the same malinvestment? I think legislation can cause malinvestment. Um, you know, industrial policy would be an example of, of I, I think, in legislation that causes malinvestment. Uh, government says, oh, we need, you know, we, 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 we need to have a, a more steel output. Uh, so we're going to arrange through tariffs or subsidies or some combination to create more steel output. Well, as long as that legislation continues, then that factory will be able to produce more steel output. When the, when, the, when the legislation stops, then the special privileges that promoted that extra output of steel, that legislation goes away, so too do the incentives to, and the ability, indeed, to produce that kind of steel. So, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think of a more, of a more elaborate and impressive answer to your question, but, but my, my answer boils down to yes. Yeah. Hayek is well known for his skepticism toward empiricism. Additionally, Austrian economics gets treated like some sort of fringe thing. It seems that economics has been taken over by the scientism attitude. Broadly speaking, could you discuss the limits of that empiricism as applied to social sciences? Could you suggest a happy medium, as there is something to be said to empiricism? So, yeah, so look, I use, I, use data, I use data all the time. Um, the, the, the naivete arises when people think that data speak for themselves, or that data are independent of theory. Um, I don't know who first, made the who first coined the term, uh, but Pete Betke uses it a lot, and it's perfectly uh, uh, accurate. All data are, th are what he calls theory-laden. Uh, you cannot understand social science data without, uh, without some theory. I mean, uh, we have data on, on I mean, some of this is, is, is very obvious. We don't, we don't even think about it. But uh, uh, so we have data on capital goods. Well, what's a capital good? A, a capital good, something is a capital good only if some human beings understand it to be a tool to produce something. Right? A, a, a piece of machinery is just a set of molecules arranged in a certain way. Uh, it doesn't, and, and, and it, it's only useful if individuals understand it to be a, a piece of capital. And so, and so uh, uh, when we do economic theory, we have to understand what individuals on the ground understand, think they understand about what they're doing. And to, 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 to grasp what individuals operating in the economy think they're doing or think themselves to be doing when they operate in the economy, very little of that can be revealed by quantitative data. There are a whole bunch of problems with quantitative data. This is not the place to get into it. I mean, that would be a whole lecture. Uh, uh, but the... The, one of the, dis, the distinguishing feature of Austrian economics today, and, and you're right, it's, it's, it, it is a fringe, I'm sorry to say, I regret to say, it's a fringe. It's not the mainstream. But the distinguishing feature, or a distinguishing feature, is we're, just, we're, we're not afraid to, to uh, say there are things we can understand about economic outcomes and economic behavior uh, without requiring data for that understanding. And there are things that no matter how much data we have, uh, we will not be able to accurately measure or fully understand. And that's just the nature of the world we live in. And so let's stop pretending that if we gather enough data, no matter how big it is, uh, process it 
enough times that somehow we'll get the key to uh, understanding all there is about how the economy. The economy is not a machine, and a lot. And the, and, 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 and the way most people think of the economy, think of it as a mach, it's a machine, right? We're all inputs, and capital goods are inputs, and so if we just study this machine carefully enough, gather enough data on it carefully enough, then then at at, at some beautiful point in the future, um, government officials will be able to look at all this data and know how the machine works and engineer it to do just right. And the, you know, Austrians and all sensible economists say, that's just nonsense. That's just, that's just a foolish way to, to think, think about the world. When I was, my first year of graduate, I started my graduate work at, N, at NYU. And when I was at NYU, I was, I was there 80 and 82, uh, a guy named, uh, 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 oh hell, um, I'm having a brain freeze. This happens when you get to be my age. Not Simon Kuznets, but the, 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 uh, the inventor of input-output analysis. So the, he was a, he was a uh, Russian economist. Uh, he, was in the he was a Nobel Prize winner. He was on the faculty at NYU. His, his name's going to come to me, and I'll be really embarrassed that I... That I huh? I think it started with an L. Yeah, Vasily Leontief. 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 I remember seeing him. Mean, he was a big name. I remember seeing Vasily Leontief. And... The, I was in the Austrian program, and, we, and it was in a room about this size, and there was a conference table. Um, but it was also the room where Leontief taught one of his seminars. And Leontief had this big, gigantic input-output table on one of the, on one of the walls. Input-output is, so along one of the, ac I forget which, one, along one of the axes you have you know, input, you know, this kind of labor, that kind of labor, steel, aluminum, magnesium, tungsten, blah, blah, blah. and then over here you have... Uh, uh, steel, aluminum, that kind of labor. So you have all these combinations of all these, of all these things, and, and somehow over here you'd read the outputs that were produced. And his belief was that, well, if we gather enough of this data, then we'll finally figure out how to plan the economy. You know, even, even as a 22-year-old uh, uh, graduate of Nichols State University, I'm like, this is just nonsense. This is not, this is so, this, this is, whatever, whatever date this chart was put together, it was out of date the next day, right? Prices change, and so input combinations change. And, 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 and so there's this scientific belief, as Hayek called it, that, that society can be engineered. And it's a, it's a kind of, of, of uh, uh, quixotic, Quest, quest that people have that, well, if we only get enough data, if we only look at it objectively, enough computer power, then, 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 we'll, then we'll be able to, we, 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 don't, we won't have to, 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 to rely upon this messy, uncoordinated uh, market process. And the Austrians look at the, this so called messy, uncoordinated market process and we celebrate it. This is great. We each get to choose our own ends, subject only to the uh, you know, equal freedom of other people to choose their, their ends. Um, it's not perfect. There are mis people make mistakes, but it's a wonderful ongoing entrepreneurial process. And if you want to look, if, 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 does it work? Well, yeah. We're sitting five floors above the ground with artificial lighting, indoor plumbing, cell phones, take out pizza, right? <laughs> Uh, 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 huh? Fruit out of season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so of course it works. It doesn't work perfectly, uh, but I, 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 I got off in my, on, a, on, a, on a tangent. I'm prone to get off on, but I'm not sure I answered your question. But yeah. could you discuss the events surrounding the arrival of Vernon Smith? So, so that came that came later, but that was but, but Vernon came here because of. So the, 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 the first was, was Jim, the, the first big move was Jim Bennett coming here. Uh, uh, then uh, Karen Vaughn coming here. Then Walter Williams coming here. Then the Public Choice Center coming here with Jim Buchanan, Gordon Tullock, Charles Rowley, uh, 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 Dick Wagner, who just also just retired, moved here in 88. So, so by the, by the mid-'80s, George Mason already had a reputation of, okay, if you want to study really interesting economics, you come to George Mason. Uh, if, if, if you want to do clever puzzle solving, you go to MIT. 
if you want to do, if you want to study economics and, and, and uh, in the tradition of Hayek and the old Chicago school, George Mason is the place to come. By the mid 80s, even the old Chicago school was dead. Friedman was retired. Gary Becker wasn't doing much work. Um, George Stigler was getting old. Um, in 2001, when I returned as department chairman, I returned the same year that Vernon Smith came here. And, and I, Vernon's a good friend. I know Vernon very well. And, and it, Vernon wanted to come here because of what George Mason was. It wasn't just because, well, I, in fact, he did not want to move to the East Coast, which is why he didn't stay here very long. I mean, he's, a, he's a cowboy. He wanted to be, be out west. Uh, but uh, he, he saw that GMU would be a good place for the next stage of growing his experimental economics shop. And so he moved it here. Who is currently a part of the experimental economics program here at GMU? Exper there, there are a few. Kevin McCabe, Dan Hauser, the department chairman, still does some of that. It's not, as, it's not as prominent as it was when Vernon was still on the faculty. He left in 08. How did the economic history field start at GMU? Um, it, well, it, it always had been an important part of what we, what we do. We had a guy in the faculty named Joe Reed for many years. He didn't publish a lot, but he was a, he was a pretty prominent economic historian. He was a student of Deirdre McCloskey's at Chicago. Um, and we always liked economic history, understood that economic history is a source of really important data, qual qualitative data, for understanding the way the world works. Um, uh, so it, it, it really got, actually got going under when I was department chairman, but it had nothing to do with any great skill on my part. We hired John Nye in, I think, 06 maybe. Uh, then we hired uh, Noel Johnson and Mark Koyama. Uh, and, and, and Mark especially is just going gangbusters as an economic historian. I'm reading, I'm, I'm right now in the middle of reading his new book called How the World Grew Rich. Yeah. Um, and we had Deirdre McCloskey visit here quite a lot. When, when, she, when, when Deirdre was still Donald, that's when I first met him at the time. Um, uh, Donald McCloskey spent a lot of time visiting here. When Deirdre McCloskey spent a lot of time visiting here, we came close to hiring Deirdre. And when I was chairman, we couldn't make it work money-wise. Uh, but even when we didn't have a lot of prominent economic historians on the faculty, we had Doug North. Doug North would spend a lot of time visiting George Mason in the first decade of this century. Um, doing work with Mercatus, um, doing work, Merc Mercatus did workshops with him. So we understood the value of economic history, um, even though we probably never had. Uh, Joel Mokir spent some time visiting here. Yeah. When should a child have the right to make their own decisions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that an economist can answer that. Look, we need, you need bright line rules in society, and bright line rules by their very nature have some arbitrariness to them. Uh, I have no problem with 18 years old. I have, I have one child, I have a son. 18 years old seems like a decent age at which to say, okay, you're an adult now. Of course there are some people who, when they are 16, they are more mature than people who are in their 30s. And there are some people who they get to be in their 30s and they're not really capable of making decisions for themselves. But you need bright line rules. And so I have no problem, I have no problem with 18. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the mat. I wouldn't get all agitated and, 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 and write tomes arguing against someone who proposed 17 or 19 as the rule or 21. I don't know. I, I, I do believe it's silly, however, though. Uh, to have, uh, 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 okay, you can vote at 18, mature enough to vote, but you're not mature enough to buy alcohol. I think that's rather dumb. Yeah. What is next for the economics department and next for you here at George Mason? What's next for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not going anywhere. I, I, you have I, a book? I, I, huh? You have a book coming out? 
I'm editing a book on, on COVID for the Fraser Institute. We, we do have coming up, I mean, and, and I don't know yet what the, what the um, details are going to be. We're finally doing an in-person memorial event for Walter Williams, who died in 2020. We're going to do that on March 31st, Walter's birthday in Arlington. Uh, this just became final within the, pa within the past couple of days. I'm helping to plan that. Um, uh, I, yeah, I'm not, un unlike Tyler, I'm, I'm, I don't always have a book. I, I, I'm not that critical. I'm just very, <laughs> very impressed. Uh, I, I, I write little ditties. I specialize in letters to the editor. Um, but but uh, uh, people, ask, people do ask me and say, well, you know, when will you retire? And my, my, literally, my instinct is that retire from what? <laughs> I love doing what I do. I don't consider it to be work. I mean, you know, like all, all things have some, I don't like grading papers. That's not fun. But yeah, they, they, they pay me to do what I love. Who could ask for a better life than that? I'm like one of the luckiest people in the world. I'm astonishingly blessed. And I, I, I want to be here for as long as my legs will allow me to go into the classroom and my lungs will allow me to talk. So if I can teach till I'm 90, I'm here. So you, you'll be sending your children to have to take classes <laughs> from me. As an economist, what do you think of the World Economic Forum's reforms surrounding private property rights? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, it's just so, I mean, I, I, it's all, I do not understand this organization. This guy, uh, uh, Klaus Schwab, he, he literally looks and dresses like he's from a James Bond movie, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's like a joke. Like, like, he's like Goldfinger or something, right? And, and, and the schemes that they're, co they're concocting are like something out of a Bond movie. It's astonishing that anyone pays them attention, but people do pay them. I think it's, I, I, I think it's a frightening development to be actually quite serious. I mean, to the extent that these people with these sorts of hubristic pretensions have, that they could play in the world. I don't question their motives. I, I don't know Klaus, Klaus, whatever his name is, uh, Mr. Goldfinger. I don't know him. <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never meet him. Uh, I don't go to Davos. Uh, I'm prepared to believe that he means well and all of the people in Davos mean well. But this is a classic uh, instance of, a prime instance of the road to hell being paved with good intentions. I mean, if, you, know, you, you, you can't plan an economy in the way that they think they can. So it's, it's all bad. It's all bad. If it comes out of Davos, I'm against it, <laughs> at least as a presumption. There is what can be seen and what cannot be seen. Sometimes, and especially for government, it is hard for them to see the opportunity costs of policies and sometimes make bad decisions. For example, many countries have import tariffs causing both countries to lose. What can we do about this situation? So it's a, it's, 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 a good, it's a good question. It's a question that goes back at least to Adam Smith's day. So we're talking two and a half centuries ago. Um, the only thing we can do is, is tell, promulgate good economics. Most, most of the support, so oh, look, a lot of the support for protectionism comes from from special interest groups who stand to gain by it. Right? They, they, they have no ideological interest in protectionism. They, they, they would be ardent free traders if they thought it would make them richer. They're protectionists because they think protectionism, and quite correct, protectionism is, is going to make them richer. But the public supports protectionism largely because the, protect, the public is ignorant of the consequences of protectionism. And so uh, what we do is try to correct as best as we can, those misperceptions. We don't have to convince everyone. Uh, we can't convince everyone. But I had a colleague here at George Mason many years ago. He's dead now. His name is Bob Tollison. He was a very famous public choice economist. And one day when I was a very young economist, 1986, 80, 87, I was in Bob's office and I was complaining about something, lamenting, well, I feel like I'm not having any impact. And Bob had this, had this uh, wonderful South Carolina accent. And he said, Boudreaux, don't worry about it. We're all part of the equilibrium. And what he meant by that 
is, as however bad you think the world might be, it would be even worse if you weren't contributing good to it. And, and, and uh, I, I think that, that is a good, pers that is a, 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 a necessary perspective. So all we can do, we're, we're just tiny voices, each of us in the world. And we just, we just do our best to convey the truth as best as we can. And we, but, but we should do it politely and in a civil manner. Uh, you can't beat someone over the head and you know, believe what I want you to believe or else. It's not, that's not a very persuasive way to go. And so that, that we, just, we just, you know, I mean, look, at the extreme, you do something like Adam Smith. You, 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 you write a book for the ages that persuades lots of people. It's been done a few times. It'll be done again. Maybe you'll be the person who writes that. But probably not. Probably none of us would be. No, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not, an, I'm just being realistic. I mean, I hope, you have a better chance of doing it than me. I'm already 64 years old. If I haven't done it yet, I'm not going to do it. You might do it, right? But, but the point is, even if, you, even if you don't write the next Wealth of Nations, you do it, you, you become a teacher. You, 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 you talk to your neighbors. You talk to your children. You talk to your friends. You talk to your, your family, uh, your coworkers. And, and that, persuade, that, that, that has an impact on people. You've written in the past that insiders buying and selling stocks based on their own knowledge plays a critical role in keeping asset prices honest. Why is there such a stigma against insider trading? And do you think there is a time when decriminalizing insider trading should happen? Wow, you found, you found the really, okay. we go from, from ideas to insider trading. I don't rule it out. I think it's unlikely because it, the, the name insider trading is so bad. But that, your question gives me an opportunity to, to tell, to complete the story of George Mason. So in, in um, uh, uh, you, you're quoting from a piece I wrote in the Wall Street Journal back a few years ago. Oh, I, 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 I didn't do any original research on insider trading. I was inspired by the work of a man named Henry Manny, M-A-N-N-E. Henry Manny was dean of the George Mason School of Law from 1986 until 1997. Uh, and he was on the faculty until, until 1999. Henry Manny is the person who made George Mason's law school what it is. And George Mason's law school was going bankrupt. And Henry Manny came in, completely redid it, and he made it the great law school that it is today. He wrote a book in 1966 called, uh, it's called uh, in, De in Defense of Insider Trading, something like that. I mean, that'd be the exact title. But it was very controversial when he wrote it. And I read the book, and I knew Henry, and uh, um, uh, he persuaded me that, that, that insider trading is, 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 is a good thing, unlike a bad It's got a bad name. But all insider trading is are, are people who have... Uh, 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 special knowledge about what's happening in a, at a corporation, trading on that knowledge. Oh, you, you, you happen to know that uh, there's fraud going on in the corporation, so you sell all your shares. You happen to know that the corporation is on the verge of making a, 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 a major, likely very good discovery. You buy shares in that corporation. What that does, right, uh, is the, the, when, you, when you sell, when you buy, when you sell, you, you cause the share, those share prices to fall. When you buy, you cause the share prices to rise. Hayek taught us that prices convey information. So insider trading causes the price system to convey information more quickly than it otherwise would. By preventing in, insider trading, you are preventing the market from disperse, dispersing information as quickly as it otherwise would. Now, I can't say this without saying that um, and, and I say this in, the, in that Wall Street Journal piece of mine you quote from, uh, there are s uh, certain conditions under which it is desirable for the corporation and for society for insiders not to trade on their information. We have a long history of corporate uh, bylaws specifying when and when it's not lawful for corporate uh, 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 insiders to trade on information. Insider trading was not illegal until 1961. We, 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 we think of it as, it wasn't, it, it was, it, insider trading is one of these pieces of legislation 
it wasn't even real legislation. Uh, the, the, I can't remember his name. He was a Columbia Law School professor. He became chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission when President Kennedy took office. Kennedy appointed him. It was one of his big pet peeves to make insider trading unlawful. So this guy finally finds himself an, uh, a, a head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So he writes regulations making insider trading unlawful. And, and that's, how, that's where it came from. It, 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 it wasn't anything organic. It didn't, uh, uh, the, uh, the American system of corporations was go going on just fine until 1961. There were no major problems. And then this guy comes into office and he, he, he makes it unlawful. And to this day, these regulations are on the books. And, and uh, 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 just, just the other day, I happened to see, uh, I'm not on Twitter, but someone sent me something from Twitter. Uh, uh, someone uh, who doesn't know me or what I am about or what George Mason's about said something like, well, I looked up this Professor Don Boudreau, and clearly he's a kook. That's the word. Because he, he actually argued that insider trading should be legal. And that was like this, oh, well, clearly you can't pay attention to someone like that. Like he believes the earth is flat. Uh, he, he, he believes that you cure yourself uh, from cancer by using crystals, and he also believes in insider trading. So, so it, 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 it's a hard, hard argument to win rhetorically. But the economics of the case are pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the, it, it's not, it, it, it's not it, it's not complicated. I think every serious economist who's looked at the question says, oh, yeah, there are certainly certain... So if a corporation wants to outlaw inside... If a corporation wants to make insider trading, wants to not let its insiders trade, it has always been possible for corporations to do that in its bylaws. And they have done it to the extent that they wanted to do it. We don't need the government to make illegal insider trades that the corporations themselves don't wish to make illegal. What do you think are the causes and solutions for the problems of higher student loan prices, healthcare prices, and housing prices? So you point to the three sectors in which there have been uh, long-run secular increases in the real cost of things, housing, health care, and education, particularly post-secondary education, higher education, my line of work. Right? These are all uh, industries that have unusually heavy involvement of the government. Right? Supermarket prices, uh, abstracting now from the recent inflation, that's a separate story. Supermarket prices are falling. Consumer electronic prices are falling. Government's not really much involved in supermarkets and consumer electronics. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that the rising prices of higher education, health care, and housing are all in sectors that have unusually heavy amounts of government. I think, actually, I think the worst is housing. Uh, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, uh, and when you restrict the ability to build new housing, you restrict the ability of people to move from where opportunity is waning to where opportunity is growing. And then that has impacts on trade policy and other policies uh, because, you know, well, if I lost my job because of, of imports in, 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 in Tulsa and I want to move to Colorado, well, Colorado, I'm just making this, these, Colorado has housing restrictions. You can't move to Colorado because you can't find a place to live. So you stay in Tulsa? Well, there are no jobs in Tulsa. If you look back in American history, when trade patterns change and economic patterns change, Americans are highly mobile. They were moving all over the place. When the dust storms hit Oklahoma in the 1930s, the Joads got in their car and they drove to California, and they, 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 were, they were very poor. Drive to California now, you can't find a place to live. And so I think housing is a real problem. I think, that, I, I think housing may be the be the, the single most pressing regulatory problem now facing America. It, it's the one that I worry about most. It's the one that I would like, I would like to see, uh, uh, mo th that I would most like to see fixed and fast. I think it's a very bad, it's a really bad issue. I'm a homeowner, it's helping me. <laughs> it's raising, it, it's the, the, the value of my house is artificially inflated because of housing restrictions in Northern Virginia. Uh, but uh, it's a real problem. 
Well, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Especially for you, because I suspect none of you own a home. Yeah, it's going to make it more difficult. Yeah. And by the way, it also raises rents. So, all right. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you Thank all. Thank you very much.